down, we'll get the, the meeting underway. I'm Bruce Warner, I'm the president of the TriMet Board of Directors. And I'm gonna call the April 24th, 2013 meeting of the TriMet, TriMet uh, Board of Directors to order. So with that, I'm gonna go right into the agenda and ask for the report. So ask our general manager to provide his comments. Mr. 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 Board President, members of the board, good morning. I did wanna just start with a couple unfortunate incidents and in reverse chronological order. Uh, as you know, um, last night the upper deck of the Markham Bridge was closed due to a, a, an accident involved one of the girders uh, that was going to be delivered to the Tillamook structure on the Portland Milwaukee project. Very fortunately, there were no major injuries. Matter of fact, it was amazing that with the, uh, the situation at hand that there actually were only uh, cuts and bruises associated with uh, the incident. Um, Unfortunately, obviously, I-5 was shut down for quite a while associated with that, and that meant uh, a great deal of uh, consternation on the part of drivers and bus, bus riders and bus operators as well. Um, Van Dyke Trucking, the subcontractor, sub was to haul, uh, was contracted uh, as a sort of specialty contractor. There was an ODOT permit related to the route that was being used. Um, the beam was cut up as it was removed, so it will take another 30 days to make a new beam. That's the least of the problems, frankly, because that won't seriously affect the schedule of the, either the, the, that segment or the project overall. Um, so while the ODOT, ODOT did approve the haul route, we are um, in a, at a pause today to review the situation and make sure that it is the right haul route and that the situation safety is always first in, in our mind related to that. So again, um, an unfortunate incident, but we are taking a look at it today with, uh, with extra, extra focus, of course. Um, I also just wanted you to note about uh, the stabbing that happened last night uh, with one of our bus operators. He was using a portable restroom at the end of the line 19. Uh, the operator uh, heard banging on the door. Uh, somebody burst in as he opened the door and stopped, stabbed the operator in the leg. Fortunately, I can tell you that the operator is, um, is on the mend um, and the injuries were not serious. Um, we are working closely with the Portland police uh, in their efforts to catch the man responsible. We're also addressing the safety associated with that restroom location uh, and whether or not there is a better alternative. Um, we are, uh, in the very short term, uh, have picked up patrols related to that area. Um, but longer term, we're obviously looking for a better solution related to that, that physical um, uh, uh, toilet facility. Um, so I wanted to then turn to ridership, but if any board members have any questions on those two topics. Questions here? I guess I would just ask <coughs> any initial reasons for the accident on the truck, on the, on the Markham Bridge, was it a load shift or? We actually don't know, okay. and my impression is that it will take us a while, a day or two or three, to actually make sure that we have all the information from all the sources um, before we actually know that. Um, yeah, just in case you're wondering about liability, um, at this point in time, it was not um, Trimet property, it was not delivered to the site, so um, it's covered by the, by the trucking company at this point in time in terms of liability from our view. Um, turning then to ridership, um, our bus numbers continue a slow, steady growth, um, one to three percent since September. Um, Max, of course, is impacted by the change in the elimination of the free rail zone. Uh, overall, though, ridership for the month was down. Um, 0.8%, which is we're beginning to see uh, our numbers begin to grow into the uh, sort of the, the same numbers that we had last year. West continues to increase uh, up by 6.4% the last month. Um, off peak riders appears to be a little better than peak ridership. Um, we're going to be bringing a much more detailed report uh, to the board on ridership and the effects since the fare increase and the uh, limited free rail zone will bring that to you probably this summer or sooner, uh, as soon as we have it, that really studies the, uh, the effects of the ridership uh, geographically and by line. Um, and uh, again, my notes tell me that that should be available for you in June. Uh, I also wanted to pass along another very important milestone for us. Um, over the weekend, uh, we were just finishing up the installation of our last 13 buses for the CAD ADL system. Um, and this is one of these things, I think, it, I always think of this uh, 
Indiana Jones as he's running out of the tunnel and the, and the big rock is coming right behind him. In this case, the big rock coming right behind us was the failure of our old system, which actually did fail us again on Friday. And so over the weekend, we were able to turn on the new Cadet Vale system completely. And so that was a major milestone that we've been working on. A little accelerated from what we had originally thought, but that's a good thing that we were actually um, in the midst of. Does uh, everybody know what the CAD ADL system is? Uh, computer aided dispatch and ADL automated. Thank you, Mr. Board President. Um, so we have that state of the art system now up and running, and over the summer and the next few months, we'll be able to turn on more and more features of that, which will also allow us to provide better customer information about delays and, uh, for example, if buses are are stuck along the side of the road or stuck in traffic, we're going to be able to communicate that with our customers. So um, I really do want to thank our hardworking maintenance staff, dispatch staff and our contractor in it who were leads in getting this accomplished all in very short order. So I think it's a huge milestone. So you know that was a very big investment of uh, past years for TriMet. And finally, I've been part of a growing number of outreach events where I'm meeting with writers and constituents around the region. Um, I've met now with a number of small groups to talk about our budget, our service, some of our long-term goals, and some of our long-term issues, and I found those very rewarding conversations to have. Um, it's um, two occasions now I've gone out to transit centers to actually talk with riders as well as operators, and I'll be doing that again later, actually, I believe, tomorrow in Gresham. So we're going to continue that, uh, that pace. Um, we do use the budget process as a way to begin to fully uh, reach out and communicate our status with our writers, and it's been very important, I think, to do that. Um, surprisingly, from what you may hear, TriMet actually gets very high marks for their service center system out there from our writers. Um, but the overwhelming comment I hear is everybody wants more service um, wherever we go. Um, and whether that's more frequent service, to lean into frequent service, or uh, added buses earlier in the morning or later in the evening, uh, that's the kind of comments uh, we have. I've also had a chance to talk to a number of employer groups from late, and there are, there's great interest on the part of employers to provide additional transit access to jobs, particularly the entry-level jobs that they often have trouble recruiting people for if they're not in an area well served by transit. Um, so, as you know, in the budget that we'll be discussing shortly, we've put $2.1 million for service uh, fixes and some modest improvements. Uh, I think we know that that's just scratching the surface of the needs out there. Um, but will help and is being well received by our ridership. I also wanted to thank uh, Board Member Stovall and, and, of course, David Boxier and members of Opal. We had a very uh, good meeting last night. Um, what we had agreed, frankly, and we'll talk about this a little bit further as we review the budget, is that we will complete our analysis of their suggested change in the transfer policy by the end of June, and that then we will review that with them in July and through the summer uh, and be briefing the board along the way. I wanted to be clear that I did not um, agree to implementation date associated with anything because obviously that's pending your decision once you have all the information in front of you. Um, and with that, I'll conclude my report and respond to any questions the board may have. <coughs> questions from the board? I'm seeing none. Why don't we move right on to the uh, quarterly finance report? Uh, Ms. Rexair? Uh, good morning. And I will be referencing this handout that I believe you received this morning. Uh, just wanted to hit a couple of the highlights I, uh, from the first three quarters of the fiscal year that I think uh, put in or laid the foundation for the FY14 budget. The, the first graph that I've included, I think it's one uh, Beth used to share with you, but it shows uh, job growth or employment, changes in employment in our region. And I think just a couple of quick things that jump out for me. Job growth still remains fairly sluggish. Um, there's clearly no signs of an overheated job market. So one of the things I think that indicates is there is not going to be a lot of 
uh, pressure on wage inflation. So we'll get into that a little bit more as we speak to our payroll tax growth assumption. Um, the, the next graph is uh, one that I think is new, uh, haven't shared with you before, but what we're showing is the quarterly payroll tax receipts in blue going back to 2009, and then in red, the FY13 and 14 uh, payroll tax budget. I think what stands out for me is that the quarterly payroll tax receipts clearly it's a, it's a bumpy ride. There's a lot of uh, variation between quarters, more than you would uh, really suspect there should be. Um, clearly, you can see we had a major outlier quarter at the end of FY12 in the fourth quarter. That's uh, 60, almost 62 million from that quarter. Uh, and I would point out make, that, that the results of that quarter were not known at the point the FY13 budget was put together. But um, focusing more on where we, how we're doing for FY13, clearly we are on track to exceed budget. Um, and it, but if you sort of project the, the growth that we're seeing here, we, we think we'll end FY13 at about uh, eight to nine million dollars over budget. But if you sort of continue that trend line into four, in FY14, it, it looks like we would be short of, of where we, the uh, current version of the FY14 budget for payroll tax. I wanted to review again, we talked about this a little bit uh, last month, but the components of the payroll tax growth rate uh, that we're using for FY14, these are based on the Eco Northwest forecast that we got last fall. They have a seven, they've assumed a 7.2% underlying payroll tax growth, 3.8% of growth coming from inflation, and the balance from employment, about 3.4% from employment and productivity. So I think uh, what really seems unlikely now is that, and we're not seeing the inflationary pressures on, on the economy that I think the eco forecasts of last fall. So we have asked Eco, Fork, Eco to update their FY14 forecast. Uh, we hope to have those results. We, we should have those results before your May 8th briefing. We'll come back to you um, with the, the outcome of that updated forecast. Um, to put that uh, potential change in some sort of um, uh, context, the, if, if we were to lower that inflation rate assumption from 3.8 to 1.8, to decrease payroll tax growth rates by 2%, that's roughly a $4.8 million decrease in, in total revenues for FY14. Um, that's about 1% of our total operating budget. So. Um, if we were to just take that decrease and reduce our, over, our ending fund balance in FY14, um, we would still be at the, the 2.5 months of working uh, ending fund balance that the board policy uh, has set as, as a minimum target. So we do think there's capacity within the FY14 budget to deal with those sorts of changes and assumptions. <coughs> I did want to hit the other two major revenue sources, uh, passenger revenue and federal grants. On the next slide, just point out that uh, passenger revenue is coming in about $1.7 million under budget. This is um, primarily due, uh, most of that's due to the change in assumption related to the uh, for the public school student pass program, which was not included in, in the budget numbers. Uh, FY14, we're assuming 3.2% uh, ridership growth, and uh, so all, all the revenue increase in the budget would come from ridership growth. Looking at federal grants, we, we are 
about coming in about $9.6 million over budget uh, for current fiscal year. Uh, $6 million of that is due to the additional state of good repair formula funds, uh, which have been clearly all programmed into the budget uh, for FY14. And in FY14, we're assuming uh, no impact of sequestration and the continued full funding of MAP21. That, that sequestration really just on the operating side, it does impact the Portland Milwaukee project a little bit, but we've built uh, some flexibility into funding into the debt structure of the, uh, the, the project financing. So there's really no impact on the project. Oh, some additional interest expense, which we'll, we can absorb within the project budget. I, I did want to highlight that uh, you know, we give you a lot of more, much more detailed information, but I wanted to pull one number out from the statement of revenues and expenses, and that's really looking at our the bottom line number, net results from operations, through the first nine months. And you can see it's the number that I've circled and highlighted on the bottom. We, we have a net result of operations of $59.9 million. So, but to, the next page is to, is to put together, to put that in a little context, and <coughs> compare both the FY13 uh, results with what we've budgeted for FY14. So bringing that uh, $59.9 million, $59 million result forward, what's not included in that number is uh, debt service of about $36 million and TriMet's uh, share of capital expenditures. So through the first nine months of the year, we've increased fund balance by uh, $16 million, but there's some additional things that uh, haven't been reflected yet in our year-to-date results. And two of these, the next two that are listed, the medical union medical premium reimbursement and uh, various lawsuits are components of uh, Resolution 130429 that you'll be reviewing later for as a budget transfer resolution for this fiscal year. So those will likely be additional costs to us in FY13. I should point out um, that there are certain types of expenses that are required under generally accepted counting principles, but are not expenditures under Oregon budget law. But for, and I listed the two largest ones here, and that's depreciation, which clearly is $80 million a year for us, and the unfunded portion of our uh, OPEB liability which is roughly $70 million a year. So to put, just to put those net results in context, there's still lots of uh, financial obligations that really aren't fully addressed in the uh, budgeted numbers. But just uh, moving forward to FY14, the budget assumes a net result of operations of $65 million with a debt service of 38 and a trimet share of capital of, of nearly $25 million. So it end the year with an increase in uh, unrestricted fund balance of about $2 million. Um, the, and obviously the big unknown expense for the FY14 is the outcome of the ATU labor contract or the and or the Employee Relations Board complaint. So all of those could have a major impact. Either of those could have a major impact on the, the financial results for FY14. Um, that's a very quick summary of our financial results for the first three quarters of the year. Um, that I'll stop and answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Dave. Uh, as, as we look at the 2000, uh, the FY13 employer, uh, that's slide number three, employer payroll tax revenue. Uh, actually, let's start back at FY12, the, the quarter four there. Is there any explanation of why the jump? I mean, I, 
if you look back previously, it was quarter three that's generally the, the, the outlying quarter. Uh -huh. uh, but this year, uh, for FY12, it was quarter four. We, we do get uh, detailed information on an employer-by-employer basis. Um, I have not gone back through that information to try to determine what was the real cause of the workers. <coughs> it, what can often occur is if there is, occasionally employers will get in arrears and, and mm -hmm. then make a, a catch-up payment or based on a audit, uh, we may get a large uh, outlier. Um, and this, this is basically on, on a cash basis, um, so we don't know the outcome of audits before and aren't accruing anything related to that outcome. So. I'm sorry, I don't have specifics about that quarter. It'd be interesting to know, basically, is, is this a one-time thing or is this something that uh -huh. uh, we, we would see continued increases? If it's an audit, then basically we've seen an increase in the number of folks that are working, employment has increased, and maybe wages are starting to increase. But if it's, uh, if it's something that's different, uh, if somebody's just catching up from something that was in arrears, uh, that would, but because as you look in FY13, the numbers then drop back down, yeah. not as low as they were in FY12, but they do drop back down, then they start their kind of regular rise up throughout the year. Now, FY14, we're, if we compare that to FY13, I'm looking, as I look at this, I'm seeing roughly, roughly, is that, is that about an $8 million per quarter increase? Yes. So we're talking what thirty-two million for the year. I, I right. made sure I did my multiplication correctly. Well, the the quarterly budget, if you just took the annual and divided by four for FY thirteen, mm -hmm. is fifty-seven point six, and for FY fourteen, it's sixty-five point nine. So it it is so about eight million. Yeah, mm -hmm. per quarter. That seems like a pretty significant increase. I know you were just talking about the Eco Northwest study that would give us some additional highlight of whether or not you know that's going to hold true based on because we, as you mentioned, we didn't have the FY12 fourth quarter uh, as we did this budget. And now that made some of that may adjust, but as I look at that, that's a pretty significant increase, 32 million across the across the region being added for the whole year. Yes. I I share that concern and, and find, think it would be very unlikely. We're just not seeing inflation developing it the way that Eco Northwest had forecasted it. I, I think that's the component of their growth that seems really out of line. Okay. I just got a couple no, more please, 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 please. Uh, as, you know, Sometimes when we throw the federal grant uh, conversation out there, it's you know, part of the federal grant, we're heavy on the capital side when we talk federal grants, and not so much always on the operating side. And so there's, you know, as I see federal grants, as on yeah, slide number four says federal grants, the 9.6 million above budget, and actually Jared mentioned this last night when we were in the OPAL meeting, is so that 9.6 million, where does that reside? Does it reside on the operation side or does it reside on the capital side? This is all just operating. Okay. Yep. Uh, last point of clarification, as I look at the financial results on page six, or slide six, I'm, as I look at the depreciation and the unfunded OPEB liability information at the bottom of the gap basis expenses, I'm going to need a little more explanation on it, how, how that fits into our discussion when we're talking. Uh, as we look at this, this is primarily looking at the cash, the cash effect and our in the fund balance is either an increase or a decrease. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out how this depreciation and unfunded OPEB liability fits into the conversation. Well, depreciation is always a difficult issue for local governments, and they deal with it di in different ways. Uh, I think from TriMet's perspective, where we much of our capital is funded with federal grants, um, and this depreciation includes the depreciation on those federal federally funded assets. So I think that the, the level of concern, it, it would be different than within a private entity if you, because we, we have a long history of receiving additional federal grants to, and now particularly with the state of good repair, to uh, keep those assets up over time. Uh, 
the concept of depreciation was uh, that perhaps we should be setting aside money to deal with those assets as they mature and need to be replaced or updated. Um, I think, and, and some local governments are able to fund depreciation reserves. Um, TriMet is, is long-term, more structured on the continued dependence on federal grants. And um, I think we'll con continue to be in that model of, of dependence. And I think we're in good company because if you think about the other major transit districts throughout the country, the New Yorks, the Chicago's, Boston's, they've got this issue in spades relative to us. So um, I, I do believe there will be a continued long-term federal funding of assets that we will be able to rely on to, to replace assets at, at, as, we get, as we move forward. So then in this context, as we, as we look at this information at the bottom of this slide, and we, we talk about depreciation, I'm assuming, as we, you know, based on your response, I'm assuming we don't fund our depreciation. That's correct. It's, so it's, it's an unfunded depreciation, and we also have the unfunded OPEP liability correct. Uh, amount down here. Now, we don't include, uh, let me ask it a different way, do we, do we include unfunded OPEB liability in our financial statements as far as our, our statement of revenues and expenses? So we produce both uh, a budget basis uh, financials and gap, uh, generally accepted accounting principles <coughs> uh, financials. They're, they're both audited by Moss Adams, but uh, so the OPEB, the unfunded OPEB liability is in our gap financials, but not in our budget basis. Same with depreciation. Got it. Uh, okay, now, now I'm there. All right. Good. Thank you. Um, just to go back to the depreciation discussion, I actually think this is something that we might want to flag for a little more discussion when we get to the strategic finance plan. Um, you know, I understand what you're saying about federal funding. I'm not sure I agree with your um, assumption that it's going to continue to be there. You know, given what's going on in Washington, um, you know, some of the, the efforts that have been made to reduce federal deficit. I don't know. It's there's going to be business as usual, and so I, I think that's something that we as a board probably want to discuss a little bit. So just kind of a heads up. Um, and then Travis also raised the issue about our projection on, on payroll tax. And I know there was a lot of discussion at the, the budget task force, which I served on, about the, the assumption on, on the on payroll tax. Um, and quite honestly, I've been nervous about our, our assumptions there. And, seeing this trend, my nervousness is increasing. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, I, I don't know yet, but I'm wondering if maybe this is something uh, before we adopt the budget, whether we need to, to reflect these changes. Um, it just, this is looking much more optimistic than it, than it looks like our history can. That was our intent. Go ahead. That was our intent, and why we expedited the eco Good. review of the FY14, so you would get would be able to discuss it at the May 8th board briefing Great. and make changes in the final adopted version. If we need to. Wonderful. Thank you. Dr. Do you have any questions? Yes, sir. Thank you. Any more? I just I would just echo what uh, uh, Director. Uh, I can't remember the last name. <laughs> he has, uh, has pointed out in terms of the uh, depreciation. I, I think we've got a pay-as-you-go system right at the moment in terms of the way we're dealing with the, the rehabilitation and, and keeping our system, you know, to into the shape it needs to be. So I think that's a that's a robust discussion that we need to have in terms of looking. I think ultimately we 
I think we've got the pay as you go component of it, but I think the question is do we need to do more is what I think you're asking is a really good question and, and uh, I'm, I'm glad we're going to dig into that. I think the financial strategy is, is uh, the, where we should have that dialogue. Then. So good comment. Thank you. All right. Are you done? I am. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So, <laughs> Mr. General Manager, are you going to lead the discussion also, or is this a tag team between the two of you on the FY14 budget? Yes, Mr. Okay. Uh, board President, members of the board, we did want to just use this opportunity to go through some of the issues um, that have been raised related to the budget, uh, have the opportunity for more questions or, or comments from the board, uh, and again, this will lead to further discussion on May 8th and again May 22nd, which is when the budget is scheduled for adoption. We thought the way to do this was to first uh, step through very quickly the work program that you left with us uh, as we adopted the fiscal year 13 budget and where we stand on all of those various items. So with your uh, discussion, I'll just very quickly highlight those issues and if there are questions or topics that you want to delve in further, that's what Dave and I are here for as well as the rest of the staff. The first thing was to establish the Low Income uh, Fair Mitigation Program and we can safely say that's completed and has been done. We'll provide you at your May 8th briefing uh, a status report about the grants and where we stand with that overall program in terms of getting the money out the door. And as you recall that, that you know we did have some startup time associated with it this, this one year, this first year. But anyway, we have completed that program that seems to be very well received by the constituents uh, in terms of uh, uh, nonprofit organizations that serve uh, uh, low-income families and clients. Related to the convention pass, we have been uh, have successfully negotiated uh, with a series of partners uh, to fund the convention pass of $382,000 annually. That's not coming out of private funds, that's coming out, out of the transient lodging tax uh, from, that uh, actually starts with the county but has a water through, fall through a number of different agencies. On the Portland Youth Pass, it's, uh, I think, fair to say that's an ongoing conversation. And uh, we've attached to this the recent correspondence between Superintendent Smith and then my correspondence back to her. Uh, all agree that the current status of the program is unsustainable with its current funding formula. We are proposing and included in this budget the proposal, uh, which is, uh, to a large extent, status quo, which is a one-third partnership between the various agencies uh, and Portland Public Schools contributing about a million dollars per their letter um, in the city of Portland, 300,000 in cash and then other to be determined in-kind improvements that we're working with the, the city uh, mayor's office and the Portland uh, Department of Transportation uh, on it as well. And then the balance coming from reduced fare revenue from TriMet. So that is a, an ongoing conversation that you may wish to ask us some additional questions on. Uh, related to the transfer printers, uh, that is uh, nearly done and will be done by July 1st and turned on entirely for the system as a whole. We've gone through the pilot tests and they've been very successful as we've shared with you in the past. Uh, we've realigned the lift boundaries, uh, so that has been completed. Uh, regarding fare policy, we've had one briefing with the board. We have more, another briefing scheduled on May 8th where we actually will review this again. So this is underway and I think that the, that will continue into the next fiscal year as your deliberations on the various uh, uh, equity of the various levels of the fare program are discussed. Um, and that is really the same status of the honored citizen fare. Uh, related to ridership data, uh, we have been uh, doing a great deal of work. Uh, first of all, Metro has completed and now made available to us their travel diary, diary surveys uh, that were done uh, within the last couple of years. Very detailed travel behavior information. In addition, we've updated our own um, origin destination survey related to users of the transit system. And then we've entered into a partnership with the Oregon Transportation Research and Education Consortium, better known as OTREC. Uh, and we often work with OTREC and their researchers and students. Um, but this is a grant that we were able to receive uh, from the National Institute for Transportation and Communities. Uh, and there is a broad study underway <coughs> understanding the transit dependent population. Portland will be one of the case studies, but there are other cities involved as well. And I think it will be a, a very good contribution to your understanding and our understanding of the impact of a fare and service to um, transit dependent riders. 
Um, labor contract, uh, I think you are very up to date in terms of status of that. We've been moving along as rapidly as we can. I'm very pleased that we will have a meeting with the union on ground rules on uh, this Saturday. So um, we hope that that will be followed with a number of series of meetings related to the sort of nuts and bolts of uh, negotiations. As I mentioned at the TSCC meeting, there's a great deal of mutual education that we need to go through in order, uh, which is the best part of the collective bargaining process. Um, and my hope is high that we'll, uh, we'll be able to move the ball on that one. Uh, we continue to work uh, to generate additional revenue, uh, generating ideas. Uh, Board Member Prosser mentioned the strategic financial plan, and I think that's one of the places where we want to bring that uh, and, and embed that. Uh, really important streetcar, you will recall it. You did agree uh, to a master agreement uh, last summer that we had negotiated with the city that really tries to define and clarify the roles of TriMet in the city related to the streetcar. So that has been uh, completed. Um, re regarding item number 12 on the list, uh, analysis related to lift and paratransit, whether or not it would be more cost effective to bring that in-house, we did update that analysis and share those results with you. And again, it indicated that it would be a major additional cost to bring those services in-house. Um, financial uh, strategic plan, uh, as noted, in progress and will um, uh, be, uh, as I mentioned at Board Member Prosser, as he very well remembers, the same people who do the budget do uh, financial planning, so uh, we, we are anxious to really shift gears and really focus on this uh, in the first quarter uh, upcoming. Um, capital projects, uh, that is an ongoing process and I think one that has been really uh, emphasized as we've gone through our budget process this year, which is really the whole topic of state of good repair and making sure that both safety improvements are first and second of all, reliability and, um, and other service enhancements to the public are included and reflected in our capital program. And we have a number of partnerships underway, a related number 15. Um, Best, I think, emphasized by the West Side Service Enhancement Plan, which has been a great partnership with many of the employer groups and stakeholders on the West Side. We've also been able to then, based on that, recommend a number of service enhancements that align with the long-term service enhancement plan, but will also provide uh, added access to industrial sites and job locations um, within the West Side area. In addition, we've partnered with um, a number of other entities related to some special services like the Twalton Shuttle, uh, Shuttle Service in Forest Grove, and we have a number of pilot projects in that regard that are, that are underway. Um, so that's the quick status of where we are with all of those. I think you're pretty familiar with all those items, but wanted to pause there in case there are any questions or additional guidance the board would like to provide us on those topics. Do you have any questions? Good. Um, not so much a question, just um, an indication. Yeah, I, I continue to be nervous about the um, Portland Public School Youth Pass. Um, there, to me, there is still the equity issue um, between writers within the, the Portland School District that are, have access to that um, pass and writers in every remaining school district in our, within our boundaries that don't. Um, and so, you know, I understand um, the, the politics and the need to, to work, time to work things through, um, but it's something that, you know, we're getting, beginning to hear more from suburban areas. I, I saw where uh, Washington County Chair uh, Dyke had, had raised this as a concern, and I, it's something we're going to need to spend a little more time on. And, and, see if we can work out something a little more, from my standpoint, a little more equitable to all of our writers. Good comment. I'm here to say question. I'll have to weigh in on that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I, I share, and others do share, the concern that is, that is out there. But however, I think when we, in fact, I know, when we talk about the bus pass program, we must put the elements that are out there that must be considered in each district in each, you know, each of the, the three county areas. That number one, 
it is not TriMet's responsibility primarily to provide the transportation. It is a partnership. Therefore, there is other entities must, that must include and put funds into doing this. So, with that said, please asking that the others to consider not only to talk about it as an equity issue for what happens with Portland Public, mm -hmm. but also to talk about what they're willing to do <coughs> in terms of funding their part um, to the maximum to create a partnership for that, and also to look at what are the outlying factors in terms of frequency and need of more you know, routes and things like that that happens. It's just not an easy up and down um, decision or discussion when it comes up. And of course, I'm hearing the same of the equity issues being, uh, being raised, but I'm not hearing so much on the other side to look at all the elements that are included in that to make this partnership work. So I look forward to continuing to work on this issue and hope we will come to a great resolution um, to, uh, that will be. And the whole issue of equity is, is another one that we have to talk about. Right. Because if you've never had something, it's hard to talk about what equity is. <laughs> and when you're struggling for something, it's another thing to talk about what equity is supposed to be. So we'll, we'll have to have a retreat real soon to <laughs> discuss this whole thing about equity and getting the buses together and getting rid of the yellow school buses. As you can see, there's going to be a lot of interesting discussions. Yes. Yeah. Other questions from the board? See you Please continue. Um, we have also the second part of this update, a response to all the, the questions that we heard uh, at your meeting in Hillsborough last month, and I would ask Dave to go through those uh, related to the fiscal year 14 budget. Thank you. So uh, coming out of the Hillsborough board meeting, we had some good uh, comments on the budget. First, I wanted to mention the uh, there was concern about the what was displayed in the FY13 budget column, and we had uh, included uh, elements of the uh, budget transfer resolution that will be before you later. We did jump the gun on that, and so in the FY14 approved budget, we've rolled it back to just show the uh, FY13 budget is adopted. In, in June. There was a question about the general manager's uh, salary, Neil's you know, salary. Uh, when the, and this was in the FY13 estimated column, and when we did prepare that column back in December, uh, Neil's salary had not been adjusted that time. I failed to uh, get that updated. And, but it has been now adjusted in the FY14 uh, approved budget. Um, there was concern about inconsistencies about how the CRC is, the Columbia River Crossing project is displayed between FY13 and 14 budget. Um, there I, I do feel the, the, we've consolidated all the Columbia River Crossing costs into one uh, department and where last year they were spread out, so I think it's a better presentation overall, and we have not made any changes there. Um, we were asked about what was included in contingency, and of course the contingency is set by the board policy now at 3% of the operating budget. There's no specific earmarks, uh, no, no money in contingency is earmarked for anything in particular. It is to be used if, as uh, Obligations become clear and are better defined, or as new, as new uh, requirements come up mid-year. So, um, types of items that would be funded, and one being the non-union wage increase. Uh, there's, um, if we, and another would be potentially uh, costs coming out of the union settlement or. Um, the unfair labor practice. So those are the types of things we would go back and do a contingency transfer for potentially and would be a board action before anything occurs. There were questions about uh, the payroll tax uh, support of their debt load being excessive and robbing from bus service. I would just point out again that um, the payroll tax supported debt service is uh, 
about 4.5% of Tremont's continuing revenues. Uh, this is lower than last year, when it was 5.5%, and well below the board policy limit of 7.5%. Uh, just for an analogy, a household income of $60,000, if they had the same debt load, would have a monthly mortgage of $225. So uh, try to put that in some context. Um, Obviously, we've had a lot of discussion about the uh, transfer times. Um, there's going to be more discussion of that, and Neil's reported on that, so I won't uh, go into any more detail on that. Uh, there was questions about how quickly TriMet can restore service that was previously cut. Uh, as, as you know, the FY14 budget adds back a small amount of service and expands service on the line 47 48. Um, it's a small step, but uh, helpful. Uh, larger service restoration really is dependent on a much more stable financial picture where we know the, what the, the labor situation is and have a little better sense of the, the balance of revenues and expenditures. Um, I, let's see. We, we shared with you also, we heard about uh, how TriMet's fares stack up against uh, other transit agencies, and, and we have included and provided to you a, a listing of how TriMet stacks up with other transit agencies throughout the Western United States. Uh, and the, while the 250 fare is not uncommon. Our day, our, our day pass is priced lower than many uh, other properties and other properties often have uh, express and peak premiums that we don't have. Uh, we discussed, uh, also came up at the last meeting about the uh, potential for non-union wage adjustments and here we're, we're district were really struggling with the non-union compensation, the issue of uh, total compensation. We have very different tiered levels of benefits and how that should factor into wage adjustments. So it's an issue we're really struggling with at the uh, management level and we'll be looking at over the next six months but no, no uh, non-union wage increases uh, before January of 14 at the earliest. And if, if those do occur, we'll uh, come to the board and the public and announce those, discuss those before they do occur. That summarizes the, uh, the discussion we, we received at the Hillsborough board meeting. Thank you. I have questions at work, and also, Mr. General Manager, we're going to give a little more in-depth on some of the issues like the uh, three-hour transfer and others are at work. Ha happy to do that if you'd like us to go into that. Well, I'm asking yeah. if that's what you're planning on doing. Uh, well, only in response to questions. So okay. I want to be All respectful right. of your time. All right. Topic. So why don't we see how the questions are going here. Do I see one down there, Director Prosser? Mm -hmm. so. Okay, well, I guess I would just note, and instead of having you given a large update, I just note uh, for the record that we have received the reports from the, from the staff on the, the a fair peer review, which was a very instructive, I think, in terms of where where uh, base fares are on a daily uh, and uh, single trip basis. Uh, I think it shows that you know we're right there with a number of other uh, major trans providers in, in, in the same same uh, price level. It was interesting to me to see that many times the day daily passes were over twice the amount of uh, the, the one, one trip pass on that. And that, that, as you pointed out, David, a number of the, of the agencies' properties have, you know, increased uh, prices for various types of service. So uh, I thought that was very instructive. And I, I also want to acknowledge the, uh, the work that, we, that you've done and, and, and updating us on what's going on with the three-hour transfer. And, and I think for the people's benefit here, this is clearly a budget discussion that we're going to have some further uh, discussion on as we get into the actual deliberations on the budget itself. Um, but I think it, it's fair to say we're, we're hoping the new uh, 
uh, onboard ticket transfer machines are going to give us some really good data to help really give us some, some hard information. So I look forward to the dialogue about how and when we can actually have that, that dialogue and, and have it really be based in fact. So I look forward to that.